started hooking up. We started having sex. Mm -hmm. His cat came in the room. It comes under the the bed, mm -hmm. under my back. Right. I lean back on the cat. The cat scratches at the bed. The water bed pops. <laughs> The water starts going everywhere. Get out I'm not, of here. I'm this... not effing with you. Water starts, I'm covered. It starts, and water beds take a long time to pop, but the cat's like in there scratching, drowning, in drowning in the water. Okay. The water starts going out the door. His mom comes running in. And you're buck naked. Soaking wet, right. buck naked. She comes running in. I'm trying to pop. Hold the patches of water. Only you, this could happen. I know. Hey, everybody, what's going on? Welcome back to One on One with me, Christian Harloff. Do you watch Collider Live? You don't? Well, you're dead to me. If you do, then you know that Roxy Stryer is my co host of that show. She is um, a, sometimes a polarizing figure, sometimes a, a hysterical figure, sometimes an endearing figure. She's everything. She's a utility belt, and she is just one of my favorite people. I love her because she's unfiltered. You know that about her. And we really got into her family history, talked about her, what she was like, what an interesting story that she had. If you know and you watch Collider Live, Roxy will tell a story in the middle of the show and it just, there's jaws open because of, oh my God, the things that she has gone through in her life and things that just happened to only Roxy. And this entire episode is an only Roxy type of episode because she tells stories and they're just, they're mind blowing. Just listen to her. There's things I didn't know about her and there's definitely things you didn't know about her. Check it out. Subscribe to the Apple Podcast feed. If you don't know already, you can find all the shows from the Riley Roundtable to interviews from Perry and Roca, Ryan Satin, myself. Tons, tons of interviews. Long form for your ride at, uh, to work or if you're at the gym, wherever it is, go ahead, subscribe, leave a comment, rate, do all that stuff. You know at this point what to do with podcasts. I mean, come on, what are you, stupid? What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to What on One with me, Christian Harloff. And thank you so much for listening to the show. Make sure that you subscribe to the Apple Podcast feed. We're going to be on Spotify soon. When? I don't know. But sooner is better than not ever, right? We'll figure it out. Um, there are a lot of cool guests that we've had, will have. And it's not just me on this feed. I know that uh, Riley do does a lot of one-on-ones. You can get the Riley Roundtable. There's also John Roca does some interviews here. Perry Nemiroff does some. Ryan Satin does some. So you can get all of our one-on-one -on -one interviews that we do on this feed. So make sure you do that. If you want to watch us on the podcast feed, you can do that also. If you go over to the YouTube channel, Collider Podcast, subscribe over there. Leave comments if you want to see our lovely faces. But if you just like hearing our voices, then do it over on the audio side. Here we go. I am ready to rock here one on one with a very close friend that I am happy to say that someone who is um, that we've gotten closer over the years. I have always had a really good relationship, but it's gotten stronger over the last couple of months. She is my friend. She is my co-host on Collider Live. She is an overall firecracker. You never know what she's going to say. She never, 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 never just doesn't ever put take the gloves off. She's ready to rock. It's it's Roxy Stryer. Hello, Roxy. What's a girl got to do to get an invite onto Christian Harloff's one on one? You just did it. It's taken a long time though. It, but not really. If you think about it, it's like you, you wait you, when the, wait for the you show to build. You just did it. You got to wait for the show to build. And then it's like now that people are actually listening to it and want to see that. Now you bring in the heavy hitters. Oh, we built up to me. Built up to you. So you everybody see before. You see how I'm married, right? Uh -huh, <laughs> I'm, uh -huh. I'm in a bit of bullshit. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, tell the truth. Uh, um, but it's, <laughs> it's lovely to have you here. You seem like you're in a good mood. Oh, gosh. <laughs> One of those already. We're starting with those. it. Uh, I'm in an okay mood. Yeah? What kind of mood are you in today? I Why just okay? I think it's just, uh, it's like a waves. You know, you go yeah. through emotional waves sure. every day, ups and downs. So. You know, been better, been worse. Yeah, and I love that. And we'll talk about the better and the worse because that's why you're here today. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about how you had your ride. If you listen to Cloud Live, Roxy had a ride with uh, Brett to the airport where she learned about an hour and a half together. She learned a lot about him. Well, this is about an hour, an hour and a half. And I know some things about you. I don't know everything. Yeah, I'm interested to know what you do know about me and what you don't because I feel like with you, I've picked up things over the years. But sometimes we don't expand on it because no. it's kind of we move forward and it's like, huh. I was thinking about that today, though, with myself. It's like you guys just know this version of me. Like to where like I was There's thinking. a whole different you? 100%. Like when, where you're, what, 26, 27? 27. 27. And I was thinking of myself as 27. And I'm like, the 27-year-old me 
doing what I do here now, I would have probably, I probably, I don't know if I would have lasted. Really? Yeah, I, I mean, because what? Because not because I, I liked I dated a lot, right? And like in this, in I think in this space too, I would have wound up like and gotten into a place to where it was like. I was always really honest with everybody though too. It was one of those things to where I would, what I was doing stand up comedy, it would be like I'm dating someone or you know, we're sleeping around, whatever. We'll call it what it is. It's one on one, right? Yeah. So, um, but I was always honest. Like people would ask, and I just think that I want to get myself into a thing where it's like, oh, you, you were seeing this person, but now you're seeing this person. That, that always happened in the comedy scene. And you don't think you here, would have looked very good, you mean? Probably, I mean, probably not because I was never really looking for a relationship, mm -hmm. you know. And it's like, which is fine. And that's and and you know, and especially, I'm so happy that I found my wife and that I have. I'm just a different. I'm How old were you when you found her? Thirty-one, thirty-one. Yeah, thirty-one, thirty-two, around that, around that area. Um, but yeah, it was just like it's. I'm just a totally different person, completely. But that's not me. It's not me to do. That's going to happen though. I where know. you're going to do the actual one on one with I'm me. I'm getting info right now. Right ammo. now, and it's true. Well, at the end of this interview, I'm going to let you have a couple of shots. You have a couple of questions that you want to ask. Okay, okay. But this is not about me. This is about you. And let's start about. So you, I know that you're a self-proclaimed mass hole. What you mm, call yourself? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Born in Massachusetts. Born in Los Angeles. Born in Los Angeles. Cedar Sinai. Look at that. Kind of wild, right? You're an L.A. kid. So my wife, she was a New York kid. But, yeah. But lived in L.A. Alone. I lived here for two years. The first two years of my life, I was the only one of my... I have an older brother, okay. a younger sister, and I'm the only one who was born here. And they both were born in, back in Boston. So all same mom? All same mom, same all dad. All same mom, same dad. Okay. So the only reason I ask is your dad was a rock star. Right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, so that's very... It's a, and now he's got the 20-something-year-old girlfriend but right, at but the about, time. Right. But the, but the question is is fair. A rock star could have 75 kids from 75 different women. So yeah, very true. Let's talk about your dad then. And what's because So tell me the first thing. I know he was a rock star, but, but that's about as far as I know. Yeah. He's an interesting cat, for yeah, sure. No I, shit. I always say amazing person to have in my life as a dad really weird yeah it's been a really weird road but as a guy he's an awesome person okay. he grew up incredibly wealthy oh. uh, very very wealthy his dad owned more land and was one of the biggest uh, real estate people East of the Mississippi. Oh wow! Do people say that anymore? You just East of the Mississippi. It's the East of Mississippi. There's definitely a different way that they measure that now. Mm -hmm. But he was in real estate, and so he, he my, cashed in early. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so my dad had a pretty easy time with that growing up. Obviously, different issues, family issues, and stuff. But yeah. money wise, he was set. So he decided, you know, I'm I'm going to be a, in the rock and roll industry, and I can do that because I have something other people don't have, which is money. Which is right. And that's kind of what you need if you are that young, that big of a jerk, and and need to be signing people, promoting yeah. things. That big of a jerk. What do you mean? So he's just like he was uh, the number one. Uh, there was some magazine I saw, uh, most eligible bachelor, and he was such a bachelor, okay. seeing everybody doing the right, whole. Right, right. Not, he's he's a great guy, but I just mean wheeling and dealing. Yeah. Whatever you call that. He's a womanizer? Do people say that? No, oh, like a little bit. No, he's definitely not a womanizer. Not a womanizer. And his dad really, really was. But he was a player. So, player and womanizer are different. Yeah, I, th I think it more was like, I don't care at all about anything but business. Oh, okay. So, so that was, I, would, I would categorize myself as that for, for a long time. So I understand yeah. that. I relate to that. It wasn't sure. like just effing people over left and right no, no, that no, were no, women, but it kind of was just like, just n it didn't matter. But he was know? upfront and honest, the same type yeah. of thing. Where it's like, look, I'm not looking for that. This is what I'm looking to do. I'm more focused on the goal, which is. Totally. I mean, you know. when we, he was with Aerosmith, which I'm jumping the gun a little bit, yes. but he was uh, dating Joe Perry's sister for a while and then like a bunch of different rock stars. Right, right, it it right, kind of right. all started catching up to him at yeah. some point because okay. he was with all the rock rock stars and their sisters and their wives and their and girlfriends and their the scene he was in the scene he was in the scene but how so well, what did he play guitar no my dad was a, a concert promoter and band manager oh he's, okay i see I so see. he was I not see. a rock star he was on the business side he of things he was in the business and that now explains a lot about you yeah so um, that's who I, he rolled with and that's what he was doing i understand okay so he was 
promoting all the tours. So, but he was still he was, he was in the life. Yeah, he was, he was in the life. Hardcore okay, so in the life. That, all right, that says a lot. Now, so he gets involved in that because he did he ever play music? Never once. Never once. Never sang. Never played. But just loved the scene. Yeah. Just loved the scene. Got caught up in it all. And totally. so, sorry. So he managed. So he managed Aerosmith. So he he put back together Aerosmith wow. after they broke up. In the 90s? He was managing Joe Perry, and then he put them in the eighties. Okay, put okay. them back together because Steven Tyler and Joe Perry and a couple band members, I believe, had been all using for a while, mm-hmm. and then they were clean, and they didn't want to like half-heartedly get back together they didn't want to announce it to anybody so he owned a country club at the time called glenn allen yeah and they all came and started rehearsing there and he they were secretly rehearsing and and gearing up so he gave them the place and the venue to kind of exactly and so then he started promoting them Guns N' Roses, ACDC. Wow. So, the, yeah, give me some of the lists. So, the, those, the right, that's a pretty big list yeah. all in itself. Yeah. He also promoted one of Muhammad Ali's last fights, got him out of retirement. Against uh, who? Spinks? Mm-mm-mm. You remember? I do know, but I don't know. It's, okay. on, it's on the mantle somewhere. Okay. That's yeah. fair. Um, but that's. Uh, Isn't that bad? Th- I should know. Yeah, well, that's all right. But look, there's a lot. That's, that's a lot. So, did he ever get caught up? I mean, you said he got caught up in the scene. But any stuff, and then you you were an open book, and you've talked about this stuff too. But what about drugs? Alcohol? Yeah, oh yeah, he got caught up in it all. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. He was really caught up in not never heroin. Okay, which is the thing that if you can avoid, it's the one that to avoid. So right. a lot of his friends were caught up in it, uh, but definitely cocaine. There, the my mom and dad had a big problem with. Uh, he was using a lot, and she was smoking cigarettes. And I think they finally made a deal like no more cigarettes, no more blow. Oh wow! Which were they doing it while, while she was pregnant? No, she wasn't. She never was using coke. She didn't like it. Okay. Panicky. But she was smoking. Uh, same with me, by the yeah, way. Yeah. Too panicky. Uh, but she was smoking. Not while she was pregnant. I think she did smoke a little weed while she was pregnant, which is why they say my siblings have little heads. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. But. Right. Well, where did she? Where did you meet your mom? So they met. She. He was running Glen Allen Country Club. Okay. Back east, and she was the snack girl. Snack girl, really? Yeah, and she just, was the snack girl. Wow, and you just and you just. So Won they, them over. So no, 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 not at all. Okay. They started dating, mm-hmm. and she was probably like 21, okay. and he was probably I don't know 23 at the time, oh. and he was already like he had already promoted Muhammad Ali's last fight, like oh, brought him out. 20, he was yeah. He how, was, how old was he when he started getting into this? Uh, 20. He didn't go to college, so, so or he business, went somewhere he for really like a year. Street savvy, huh? Yeah, he was just really. And he, the thing is, and I always tell people this: he's amazing and he's brilliant with business, and he was so talented. Yeah. But he had money, and it's a different game totally. when you can walk into Muhammad Ali with two hundred fifty thousand dollars in cash and say, "Here's why you should have a meeting with me." Right. Than when you don't. Right. So it's a. It was a and it doesn't hurt him if, if it doesn't hurt him if, if nothing happens. If nothing happens, it was an investment that he took a shot at and it didn't work. Exactly because he still got the bank account. Because when people look at that and they're like, "Well, if he's doing that at 21," I'm like, "But he he was bankrolled for a long he time had until he yeah. got completely cut off." But right. that's a different story. So they met. She was the snack bar person, and they were dating. Mm-hmm. And then my mom's father was the vice president of Marshalls, the yeah, you know sure. department store. Uh-huh. So he was moving it out to the West Coast. And so she moved to the West Coast. I see. And she got married to somebody else. Oh, wow. Yeah. At 21. No, she was like 23 at that time. Oh, okay. And so she so met, they were dating. So she met her met your dad. She was dating. They were dating. Moved to moved, California. Married, married someone somebody else, else at 23. Who happened to be her cousin. Say what? I know. Wait, first cousin? It was her first cousin once removed. Uh, very, uh, very unclear to this day on what was going on in her mind and how that happened, but that's the story. Wow. Is that all of my family no reunions? Kids? No, no kids? No, no, okay. no, definitely not. Okay. Uh, they were, they got married. People thought it was I weird. I have a brother, there's a third arm sticking out of his head. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> right. Uh, they got married, and then a couple years later, they got divorced. Okay. She was like, uh, move back east. Okay. Rekindled with my dad. Just found him. Went and he was. They were. Where living, was he then? He was still in uh, Massachusetts. Okay. She was in m- maybe New York, New Jersey. They started commuting back and forth to see each other, and then finally, after two years of doing that, or or a year of doing that, my mom looked at him and was like, "Propose or I'm done." Yeah. And he was like, "Yeah, okay, I'm not going to lose you, so um, yeah, let's get so married." So he did. He was in. Yeah. So they were they were probably around 27 at the time. All right, 27. 27, 29. Well, so if he 26. was 29, she's 27. Yeah. Two age, two years apart. 
your brother is is firstborn. Yeah, so he's two years older than me. Okay, so when when so at what point? How long before they wait to have kids? It was like a year. So they were quick. Yeah, they were really quick. They had so they they were pretty they were pretty they were in love. Super yeah. effing in love, yeah. and like my mom and dad were crazy. Yeah, like and, uh, my dad still is. They're crazy, you know yeah. that kind of love where like throwing, fighting, passion. Like, yeah, yeah, it was yeah. not. I did not grow up with your parents. <laughs> it was not like oh, I wonder if mom and dad love each other. Like they were. It. Uh, yeah. it, but like in the most fighting all the t- but ups downs making out right, like they right. just were you so still, you, you into can, each you other you remember them fighting but you also remember them hugging and you remember them kissing, kissing. And all, i remember uh, hearing them have sex like really yeah because my door touched their door for so many the years the first time you hear that does that scare you completely oh, you don't know what's going I, on i think someone's getting murdered in there oh i knew about sex very very you young did. my parents insisted we, we were like how old i was like four when they no. talked to us you about were it four i was we were really young my sister must have learned when she was five because she taught her whole kindergarten class about it yeah and she got sent home that uh, day. that makes sense yeah, yeah so they wanted us to know because my mom and dad always said like a vagina is a vagina and a penis is a penis and yeah. the earlier you know what they do the safer you are and it's nothing to be ashamed of that you have one or you have do you find the that other. to be true in, in life did it work out for you i mean do you wish honestly, you would have known later on in life or no you... i don't think so i i love i love my story like I know a lot. Of, I had sex very young, but I love. What's young? I was fifteen, so yeah, yeah. not horribly. Um, but that's I, probably, that's I lost my virginity in the most perfect, amazing way ever. So good it, person. No. <laughs> <laughs> not a good person. So why is it an amazing way? Because because he's great. But just not a great person. Well, you didn't ask if he's great. You said he's a good person. Uh, probably not. Okay, but you you but, but you guys but you were, he was good to you. No. No. Okay. No. <laughs> so why is he great? Because. He was a dick to you. No, he wasn't a dick to me. He, Why is it the most amazing way? All right, so. <laughs> we'll jump around. That's fine. Tell me yeah, sorry. totally. Um, I grew grew up uh, in Newton, Massachusetts, which is a closer to Boston, and we used to summer in Plymouth, Massachusetts, okay. where it's right before the Cape. So the it's not like the Cape in the sense that people who live there live there all year round, except for this douchebag, aka me, who comes into summer there. Right. So uh, off the bat, it's like, who is this rich bitch coming into summer where we live? Right. So I had to make a group of friends really quickly at a young age so that I wasn't like picked on or anything mm-hmm. coming in. And the boy next door, we'd owned the house forever. My dad grew up with his parents, so the boy next door. I, he was two years older. He had shaggy blonde hair. He was so cute from the time that I was four going there. I had the biggest crush you had on crush him. crush on him for a long time. And he, I became friends with all his friends. They protect, They made sure nobody gave me shit. They right. just were like everything to me. But I had the biggest crush, biggest crush. Obviously, when he's in high school, I'm in middle school. He looks at me as a little kid. Finally, when I enter high school, he looks at me like a more eligible right. bachelorette. Right, right, right. So she's blossoming. Yeah, but he was, you know, he I remember looking at his table beforehand. There was like 18 little notches on it. I was like, what's that? He's like, all the people I've had sex with, like Uh. one of those. uh, He is a heroin addict. And so there that's been a long road of of me trying to help him with that to this day. Uh, And but I I, at the time I had such a I wasn't in love with a heroin addict at the time. I didn't know at the time, wow. but yeah, I believe he was using. Probably Wait, so you're back 15, then. and how old was he? 17. 17. A heroin problem at 17. I think he probably started about the next year because he's been okay. using for about a, a, a little over a decade. So okay, yeah. so I'm sorry. So yeah, you, yeah, yes. no, it's okay. Um, and he is like, you know, it's not fair to not say he's a good guy. He has the best heart. Bad choices. Bad choices. Yeah. He's made some really, really bad choices, and he's ruined some pretty. He's ruined some lives, right. a lot of lives. Not okay. mine, though. Right. Because I just summered there, and then I would leave. Right. And then I would come back, and it's I'd like look at all the fallout. Episode the affair. Right. But right. one night, I had at this point, I had had alcohol poisoning twice, and I was out with him. When did you so, start drinking? You're 15 years old. What time? Probably you about 12. You started drinking at 12. Mm-hmm. Wow. Okay. And so I was, which is because I was with my grandma in Italy, and she used to leave me alone while she would call her forty-year-old boyfriend in the room, and so I would go out wandering the streets drinking. That's how I started drinking. All right, I got there's so much yeah, I have I to pause. Hold I on, know. we'll come back to that because I'm I'm, I'm literally making a th- where I need to go back. <laughs> You're going with your grandmother so, at twelve. It's I have to go here first. Oh, okay, we're going here first. We have to go here first. We'll get back yeah. to the fifteen-year-old. Um, yeah. You. you so go- my dad's mom is also kind of a rock star. She, what does she do? She has purple hair and a nose piercing. She didn't do anything Bumbles in the rock in and roll industry. No. Okay. So 
she lives half the year in Israel and half the year with us in Newton. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and they, my dad built her carriage house yeah. and whatever. So she lives on the property. So when I was bought mitzvah, she, every year, every time any of the families bar bought mitzvah, she would take them on a trip of their choice. Okay. I wanted to go to Italy. So that's, just you and her. Yep, yeah, just us. And at this point, we had a really good relationship. I would see her, you know, once a week because I would go over there for a day, whatever. Yeah. You're 12 at the bar mitzvah? Yeah, okay. I was 12. Most people are 13, but women are allowed at 12. Okay. So I, I had just turned. Um, I know nothing I was 12, about this. I was 12. You know what a bar mitzvah is? I know what a bar mitzvah is, yeah. but I know nothing about the tradition. So itself. it it's, you know, you study for it. You do yeah, It's yeah, a whole yeah, big yeah, thing. It yeah. takes you years and years. So as a, as a present, she wanted to go on a trip with us. You know, yeah. a lot of people will end up writing you a check. Grandparents will write you a check, whatever. She was like, she I want to do something with you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I want, I want to see you to see stuff. So you choose Italy. You guys go to Italy. chose Italy because I liked Italian food. That was as simple was as it. my process at the okay. time. Like, ah, I like Italian food. And so we, we go to Italy, and it ruined our relationship to this day. Because, really? Yeah. What? To this day, but we you, have issues. Before Italy, we you good. guys were great. Yeah. So what happens in Italy? So in Italy, what I learned, I learned a lot about her. Obviously, we're li- we're living together. We went for three weeks. Three weeks. Um, and your parents are cool. It was three with and a half weeks, almost a month. Your parents are uh, cool. With three weeks away. Yeah, my what parents were fine with it. It was the summer. It was summer. It was summer. Okay, I, see, I see. And so it was. It was. I wasn't going to camp that year. I went to sleepaway camp, but I guess I wasn't that year. Okay. And so it was. They were fine with it. So we we were there, and, and they weren't very strict. Your parents, no, right, right, no, right, for sure not. Okay, and uh, my grandma was dating, who's still her boyfriend now, but she was probably seventy something at the time, and she was dating a forty year old guy. Wait, who, she was seventy something at the time when you went? Yes. So how old is she? She's she still she's still eleven now. She's, yeah, she's eighty in her late eighties. So I keep forgetting how young you yeah, are. Yeah, I'm twenty seven. Okay. Keep so. forgetting how young you are. Yeah. So she was in her early seventies, yeah. and she was dating this guy who was forty, who lived in Israel, but she didn't want him to know that I was her granddaughter because that would age her, right? Mm. And she was nervous if I was in the room when they were on the phone that I would say something. So she would talk to him for like three hours a night and she would kick me out of the room. Yeah. And I'm 12 and I'm in Italy and I'm by myself. Yeah. So she, we, we were like in this bus group and I made friends with these 16 year old girls. And so I lied and told them that I was 16 as well, which right. I'm sure they didn't believe me because I looked like a 12 year old. And right. I was one of those 12 year olds who looked like a 10 year old. Like I did I like not me. like, yep. it was not like, ooh, this girl could pass. I was flat chested. I was chubby i was i had bangs straight up like it was not a it was not a 16 year old right. looking kid but i think they thought it was funny so we would go out while my grandma would talk to him for a couple hours and we would just get hammered it was the first time you drank ever in life yeah i think i mean maybe i tried my parents didn't drink neither of my parents drank oh wow so this is so this is this is you i mean you matured on this trip yeah like for 12 sure. years old you're, you're going out drinking with with these 16 year old kids in italy but then also because my grandma was 70 and had already been everywhere because she traveled the whole world she didn't want to go anywhere so if i was like i want to go see pisa right. she would say go ahead what's the point but i, I couldn't go but she wouldn't come with me so I was just off for three weeks right. by myself, what's essentially. The of, what's the point of her taking you? I I still to this day am a little unclear about it. And at some point we'll have a conversation about it. I'm sure I was a brat to her and a bitch about it yeah. because I was a brat at that age okay. for sure. And like life had to hit me really hard for me to not be anymore. Is this the grandmother that talks about your hair? No, no. Okay. Okay, that the other that one I have a great relationship okay. with. Okay. This one still lives back east. I see. Uh, and yeah, demoed our relationship because I was like, she took me. She took me at that time, those 3,000 miles from home to be in this country. She will not leave the hotel room. Right. I'm not even allowed in the hotel room a lot of times. I'm I'm in the city by myself, yes. wandering around. Like, uh, and, 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 and you're lucky that nothing happened, happened to you. Happened to me. Yeah, like da- da- danger-wise, there's no one really watching you, and you're 12 years old, you're getting hammered. Who knows where you would have wound up? Totally and completely. Where did you wind up? All, all over the place. Honestly, I was so young and so, like, a couple drinks would really do me in. Yeah. I don't know, Christian. Uh, I know that at one point I was with this guy who was a, a flame eater, like a okay. yeah, yeah. whatever, with knives and flames. Uh-huh. Um, and I, I trained with him for, like, 12 hours one day. Right. I, I don't know, like, on how to, how you, how to that? put flame down my mouth. You, 
That was like yeah. one of my days. It's like a strange Netflix series. Yeah, it was really weird. Yeah. Uh, and it was, in the end, I'm so grateful for the trip because I got to see something that most people don't ever get to see in their lifetime. Sure. And it was so wonderful. And I, I did have a blast. But like at, when I came home, I was straight up in, I was withdrawn because right. I, I came home and I was like, I was drinking for three and a half weeks straight. And right. so I was like, uh. And so you're 12 years old now, drinking like a. I was like probably a, 13 like a, when I got home, yeah. Drinking like, you know, a 20 year old. Um, and yeah, you said it ruins your relationship. You get, that's resentment for sure. I definitely resented her for a really long time. I and, can understand why. And I don't now, but it's still a strain. Or it's still. And you know, actually, she's one of my only relatives that does listen to some of our shows. Yeah. Like she loves me and does try to support me in every way she can. She just is. She'd been alone for a very long time. She is set in her own ways. And if she didn't want to do something, same as my dad, she's not doing it. See, I can understand that. But if, if it didn't come down to the, hey, I'm buying you this trip because of your bar mitzvah so I could go with you right. and hang out with you. But I'm not going to. But I'm not going. You go and become a, a woman at 12. I don't love it. Yeah. I don't it, love it. it. Same. Yeah. Same. And, and so, that's all I can say about yeah. that. But sometimes life hands you things. And that's that. Right. Okay. So that that's a lot of context. So then now we flash back. Now we f- fast forward yeah. to 15-year-old you. You got this kid who's about to go into this horrible journey in his life. Yes. Um, but you are drinking already. So the, the, the point was that I had alcohol poisoning twice by this point. Got so it. my parents gave me a curfew because they thought that. You know, You're wind up dead yeah, in an alley. Yes, yeah. and they loved me more than anything. They were not capable of being strict. It was not. They didn't have a bone in their body that could do that. They probably felt like hypocrites. Yeah, yeah. And, and so they just were like, "She's going to do what she's going to do. We're going to try to keep her as safe as we can. We're going to give her a one a.m. curfew." Okay. So at fifteen, at I had 15, a one. That's pretty good. Yeah. At fifteen, I had a one a.m. curfew, and they know I'm out with these people who are drinking and partying, and they're okay with me doing that. They don't want me to get in the car with drunk people, but for the most part, they're okay with it. So I have to call them by eleven to but say I'm alive, okay. yeah. and be home by one. So I'm out with the guy and his friends, and we're drinking, and we're on our way home. And mm-hmm. I don't know if you were the same way. I'm 100% guessing that you weren't, but a lot of women are like this, and maybe people. I knew I was going to lose my virginity that night. Oh. Like, I had planned for it, prepped for you it. Knew it was I happen knew that it night was going to happen. Guy. He doesn't know, right. but I knew, right. because I was like, okay, I'm ready. I'm doing this. I had just turned 15. I'd been waiting for my 15th birthday, because I didn't want to lose my virginity okay. at 14. This is way after the basement story. Yeah, way after okay. the basement story. And so I knew. And so I was like, okay, it's probably going to take like, I don't know, a couple minutes. So I I called my parents at 11, said, I'll be home even before one. I'll see you guys before then. Okay. I partied a little longer, and then probably at midnight, the guy and I go back to his place. Mm-hmm. And he lives next door, right? And he lives next door okay. to me. So I'm like, all right. You're right so there. So I'm, I'm going to be right there. So we go back to his place, and like any good 15 year old at the time i was like oh it would be so awkward if my phone rang during sex so i have to turn it off uh, like it would just be too awkward i don't know right so I turned it off when i vibrate i i don't know okay no idea just right. i thought that the, turn it off. that i'd be embarrassed right which probably is a sign that you're not ready to have sex if, if something going off and, if it's that plan yeah. too yeah yeah so we're listening to music we're hanging out i still don't know if he knows he has a water bed by the way which comes into play uh, and then, like, I don't know, we had a couple more beers. It, it, I just lost track of time. Yeah. I, I don't know what to say. We lost track of time. We started hooking up. We started having sex. Mm-hmm. His cat came in the room. It comes under the the bed, mm-hmm. under my back. Right. I lean back on the cat. The cat scratches at the bed. The water bed pops. <laughs> The water starts going everywhere. Get out I'm not, of here. I'm not effing with you. Water starts. I'm covered. It starts. And water beds take a long time to pop. But the cat's like in there scratching, drowning in drowning in the water. Okay. The water starts going out the door. His mom comes running in. And you're buck naked. Soaking wet. Right. Buck naked. She comes running in. I'm trying to pop. Hold the patches of water. Only you this could happen. I know. It's like an absolute disaster. I've known her since I was two. She's like trying to help me. I'm like, no, so embarrassed. My phone being embarrassing. This is the most embarrassing. Ever. It just was an absolute nightmare. 
And it sounds like a Fairly Brothers. Finally, movie. after like cleaning up and all this stuff, I mean, but it was amazing. Yeah, because, because it, it's a great, it's a great, it's a great story. story, right? So the after, cat okay? Yeah, cat lived. Okay. Uh, and then after all of this, I'm like, okay, I'm like toweling off my hair, and then I turn my phone on, and it's four in the morning. Uh. Uh-uh. And I'm like, and I have like as many voicemails as at the sure. time you could have. Sure. And I'm like, oh my god! So I I grab my clothes, I run home, the one house to home over. Right. I'm soaking wet, and um, there's a cop oh, at my no. at my door. Right. And I knock the door, and my parents get the door, and there's the cop there. And I was like, uh, and they're like, is this your daughter? I'm like, yeah. Cop leaves. I think it was just my mom actually who's down there. I think my dad stayed upstairs because he was so annoyed. Because he was always like, she's fine. Right. She's fine. She's just a bitch. She's like, she, it's fine. Just let her. And so my mom was so nervous. And she looks said, why are you soaking wet? Cop leaves. And I said, because I swam home. You weren't, So you didn't have that kind of relationship where you would tell your mom. Who, who are you more close with, your mom or your dad? I was really close. I was very close with both. But I was a really bitchy kid. Okay. And bitchy kids hate their moms. Yeah. It just kind of is what happens at, at teenage bitchy kids. Like my dad, I felt like he under, he saw me, he understood me more. Right. My mom was always breathing down my neck or whatever right. it was. But really she was just slightly stricter. Right. Which was still very not strict and I was I thought I was a little adult. Right. I thought well, that I right. I was a total adult. Um and so no, I said to her I swam home, which obviously makes no effing sense. Because what the hell am I talking where, where about? Are you and from, she yeah. was like, I mean, it was on the ocean, but where that? Yeah, where are you coming from? Right. And so, I just was like, she was like, go to bed. And uh, it, it was, yeah, it was rough. But yeah. anyway, he uh, he ended up being a nice person to me, not really nice to other people. Right. Definitely, like, has his. Is that the only issues. time? Is that the only time with that guy? No, no, no. We ended up sleeping together for years. For years. Every summer, I would go back. That was it. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, but he, he, you really I mean, unbelievable I guess in bed. Really, unbelievable. So, well, I guess so. If it was that that many times in that many years, but it's, unbelievable. But you, yeah, when you have that first experience, to where obviously you guys don't finish because the cat's gonna die. But that's uh, well, who? What girl finishes on it's, their first experience? Right, right. But that's what I mean. Though. Do you go? So then, because that first experience happens, now you're going through high school or not high school? Yeah, high school. You're going through high school. Yeah, high school. And is it, but is this guy the continued? Like, I'm gonna go back to this guy because I don't trust no, anybody else. Yet. No, not at all. Right. I I was very much so at the time. I loved this guy at my high school. Like he was, I always just viewed him as the boy next door with like the shaggy hair. And he was just a sweet, he was just a sweet kid that right. I was, it was never gonna. He was a warm up. Yeah. yeah. But he did not view me that way. Okay. Um, he liked you a lot. Yeah. I think he, he thought that I was like. The one? Maybe. Wow. Maybe. Cause here I am. I come in for the summer. I like help his life. I change things. I, I get him. Clean, get I'm you with away him. from the normal, get the, the hustle and bustle, and then yeah. I leave. Yeah. And every time I leave, it went to crap. And then I come back and I fix it all and I do everything. Right. And like I'm, you know, I. So Have you always? Been, I feel like you've always been a fixer. For sure. Yeah. And does that come from the from the family life too? I think so. I mean, my dad's the same way. I growing up, we had people using ending up on our door, my doorstep, and he he'd fix it. He'd be the fixer. Yeah. yeah. So he'd fix it. What's the what what's going on with your brother and your sister at the time when you're doing all this stuff at 15? They hated me. They hated you. Yeah, they hated me. Were they me. the good kids and you were the you were kind of the problem child? You know, I got wild s- child. I I graduated with a 4.1 GPA. Oh, so wow. it was very challenging for my parents to not, you know, they couldn't say you need to get it together because you're not doing well. Cuz you weren't fucking up in school. I crushed it. Yeah. And my brother had like maybe a two point something like he was not doing well in right. school he never touched we never touched alcohol all day but he was not doing well in school and he would sit and play video games all day mm-hmm. so he like really resented that a i was hooking up with people because he told everybody i was a lesbian and he tried to like combat the why all, why because he, he was trying he to protect want, you no he didn't want me hooking up with any more guys well because he was trying to protect you no because he was embarrassed oh he okay. was embarrassed right you he, know right like, Were you pretty promiscuous in high school? No, definitely not. I, I, well, that's not true for a high schooler, for sure. But I've I've slept with a very small amount of people comparatively, mm-hmm. just because I don't like having sex with people I don't know. Because I've tried it and I don't like the way it feels. Yeah. So like, not I, a one night stand. Girl. Right. Yeah. Just I I I did try one time to have a one night stand and it turned into like a almost stalkery situation. So oh, okay. I, they're they're just not they don't do it for me. Like right physically well it's also the, I, I think it's very different with 
not, not with all, but with a lot of times with men and women is I think that the, the connection and, and trying to find more of what's there inside of the conversation and, and who the person is and where guys are just, sometimes just be about the physicality and yeah. that's it, I'm out 100%, the door. hundred so, yeah. percent, I get that. And I definitely like made out with my fair share of people or as my Grammy calls it, did a little heavy petting. <laughs> but right, right. I, I was not sleeping around with right. tons of people. But I did make out with one of his friends, which he was pissed about. And you know, like his friends would come over and like sneak up to hang in my room or whatever and, and he that, didn't yeah, like yeah, that, yeah, that kind of stuff. Right. Uh, and just Normal in general, sibling shit. Yeah, yeah, he hated me and my little sister who was nine the first time I got alcohol poisoning and watched me like it was just I was not a good role model I was not a good sibling I was I was not a great person um I have a lot of regrets from that time what were you rebelling against what was it you know I had a lot of stuff happen to me when I was younger that I just was not capable of coming to grips with like what and um I guess I guess I don't fully even know the extent of things, but you know, like per- personal things that had happened to me. Abuse um, stuff. Yeah. Okay. Like family n- not, stuff. No. No. Okay. No. Just from outside. Yeah, and um, I was pissed. Okay. And sad all the time. Well, that'll do it. A lot of. I mean, look, man. How old were you? Fourteen. You're fourteen when it happened. It was fr- someone that you, friends of family or something along those lines. Kind of. Yeah. So just acquaintances. Yeah. It, uh, yeah, I, I, um, you know, I think that it takes you a long time to realize as a person, like, why you are the way you are. And, yeah. and I fully believe that people can black things out and shut things out until they're physically capable of, like, whatever. But, um, yeah, I was just, for a really, really long time in my life, I was really pissed and really yeah. mean to a lot of people. And it was because I was... I was dealing with a lot. Sure, and that, I mean, that's uh, usually... which is not an excuse to be mean to yeah, anybody. It, it is no, not, it's tricky. It's yeah. tricky because you don't know what people are going through. You don't know the extent. You don't have to get into the the actuality of what happened. But it's it's abuse in general. When that happens, it, it shapes people in in very different ways. And you again, where you had a very loving mom and dad and and siblings, um, but this particular thing happened to you. Your kid, right? You don't know how to deal with it. You're. This is also coming off two years later after you've lived it up in Italy, drinking by yourself. You already totally. think you're super mature. Oh, I thought I was 35 years old, right? Uh, and then you realize you're not, and there's a reason why you need certain people in your life, that like a mom you, and a that dad. That turns you right back into. I can imagine that that moment of that the, that traumatic thing that happened to you. Like you said, it comes crashing over you that you are a child. And that, like you said, like, where's my protection? I don't have that at the moment. And you feel betrayed, but you don't even know by, by Pissed who. Pissed at everyone. Right. Pissed at everyone. Right. That And not that anybody can do anything. So, yeah, I just, I I was really horrible to right. all these people. It's right. like going back to talking about my mom, who, did, who was I closer with. Did they know about it? Not for many, many years. Okay. You didn't tell anybody about it for a um, while. Yeah, for many, many years. Wow. And then... Um, when I did, everything started to change. Because they understood? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think so. Um, you, you never really know why. Like, I'm not somebody who talks about things that I, I talk about some things I've been through. Like, a lot of people know that my mom passed away. Right. And if you didn't know that um, from this conversation, that's why I keep referring to her in the that tense. Yeah, and I was going to ask you. But, um, um, and so, you know, I, I talk about a lot of things that happened, but I think that. It, there's times where you feel urged to do something yeah. and I just haven't been ready yet to talk about this, yeah. you know, um, and I'm still not. And that's OK. And one day I think I probably will be. Right. But until then, I talked to I it was like a few years later, I talked to my parents about it and they were shocked. Right. Um, because they knew the person. They. They, it wasn't because of that. It was because of the timeline of things. It all added up for them. So like, it's, right, why they were the, shocked because of how non-shocking it was. They were shocked that they hadn't seen what had happened. And the rebellious nature kind of came into play like like a light bulb, almost like, oh, that's that's why. That's and why all parent, that happened. I'm not a parent, but you are. And right. I think you can only imagine like if so, if something happened and you were just so unaware, that would be a confu- – like – you question yourself. Yeah. Um, and so it just changed our dynamic a lot as a family. Um, and and at that point, 
because I was willing to say something, I was treated more as an adult because I, I think they viewed me that way. And you were, what, 17 or so when you told them? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I was. And I think that, yeah, that's when things started to change and when I stopped being such a piece of shit because I really... I don't think it's fair to call yourself that. Well, I don't think it's fair. It's not fair because... It is. It is fair, Christian, because no matter what your circumstances are, you don't have to treat your loved ones like crap. And I really did. And I, and I really... You were a hurt, confused child that was betrayed um you you like you said before about your friend with the, with the heroin he made poor choices does that mean he's a piece of shit i don't know what else he did in his life to me that right. i know you uh, and even maybe i didn't know you back then um the core of who you are is not a piece of shit you probably made horrible choices you probably if i probably would have known you i probably said she's a dick yeah she's a dick she's a dick exactly but i think there's a different there's a difference between piece of shit and there's dick. Different, there, yeah, there's, yeah there's you're a right that, I, so i was a dick yeah and you're a dick and uh you know my biggest regret in life and i always talk about this is my so my two siblings are my best friends now my brother and my sister right. are my two best friends and that patched up also when they found out no, well partially but what I was gonna say was that my mom never got to see that because oh, really? she passed before I was f fully who I am now. And you guys were still at ends by the time when she passed. Yeah, my brother and I were barely speaking uh, because of another situation that had happened between the two of us. But my sister, she still was traumatized by what I had put her through. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, it just was, I, I can't believe she did not get to see what was going to happen but i i've talked to some of her closest friends about it and they all say she knew that it would be okay Eventually, which right. i have to believe because otherwise how do you wake up in the morning right you know? well let me say so spiritually we've had a couple conversations on collider live and what your spiritual kind of beliefs are too but do you um do you think you, your mom knows hmm i don't know i don't know she definitely believed that she would know which i liked because yeah. i think that really helped her with her journey my dad's a hardcore atheist. He grew up Orthodox mm. Jew and really raged against the machine there. I so I kind of grew up with both sides. I've never believed in in God or anything, yeah. but I I believe something. So you're more agnostic. Yeah, I I believe something. I don't know if she knows, but I know, and she's in me somehow. Right. So right. So you, yeah. So there's there's that that feeling for sure. Like when you go. So let for those who don't know, when how long ago did your mom pass? My mom passed. It, it's going to be eight years this August. Okay. So seven and a half years ago, and that means that I had just turned twenty. I was just going to say you're twenty years old, and so I just turned just turned 20. twenty. So w when she passed? Yeah, and so she stopped being able to speak or communicate months before that. What happened exactly for people who don't know? So she, when I was sixteen, my mom was diagnosed with brain cancer. Right. She had a stage five, uh, stage four glio, and that is like the to anybody who's listening who who has one or. Um, or know somebody with one they've made such advancements since then so don't take this now what it was but at the time that just was what it was right like, there was no it was say your goodbyes yeah, yeah. uh and she, you know they gave her six months she lived three and a half years wow. which was really amazing she was quite the fighter she's yeah. from new jersey so most jersey kids are yep and tom dagnino mike citizen those are two guys i always think of jersey <laughs> they're big, big the, fighters. huge yeah. fighter uh and she had actually gone through a lot uh, similar to me, but you, a lot worse in her life than I had, and she was she was just scrappy and a fighter, and right. and um, you know she was really sick for a really long time, and a lot of people did not know at first. We kept it in the family for quite mm -hmm. quite a bit, and it didn't come out for years, uh, for a year maybe, and then once it came out, it did, and there's there's a quick uh, deterioration yeah. of that. How's your dad? How did you, your dad and your mom were like? Super in law. How, how, does, yeah, he, how were, does he handle it? How does it change him? They were together for so they were married for probably twenty two years yeah. at that point. Uh, and gosh, I mean, my dad will never be the same. Yeah, definitely. How, how could you be? But he's dated his fair share of eighteen to twenty seven year olds since then. Since then, but, uh, I mean, but, <laughs> but but both both faithful during the marriage. Hundred percent. Yeah. So they're just yeah. love their lives. Yeah, that's. 100%. I mean, I couldn't imagine. So it's like a devastating thing there too. And but I'm thinking of the kids also because again, as a dad, the first thing I think of. My sister was 14. 
sister's 14, your brother's 18, you're, he's right, two years older than you? Yeah. So you're 16 years old, and you're already going. Oh, she was, my sister was 11 when my mom was diagnosed. 11, so 11, 13, 11 13, and 15. Is that, that's the ages of the kids at the time? When, when she was when diagnosed, diagnosed, I was 16, Sky was 11, and, and Jet was 18. I see. And he was in I see. college I see. in Oregon. Okay. Um, so you're already going through some shit at 16 years old. Yeah. Or 15. And then you, you how does, so when your parents tell you, I mean, is that just, that just so gotta, your whole a, world's got to go upside down. What actually happened was it was kind of wild. So my mom was a absolute hypochondriac, and okay. we grew up with her driving herself to the emergency room. All the time. Okay. All of the time. Because mm-hmm. she kept always saying, there's something wrong, there's something wrong. So my dad, my sister, and I were at basketball practice because my I was coaching uh, younger kids, and my dad was coaching my sister's team, mm-hmm. and we split a court. And my dad got a call uh, during basketball practice, and he turned to Sky and I and said, I got to go to Newton Wells. Will you guys meet me there afterwards? And so um, at this time, I couldn't even drive. So we had somebody drop us off there. My sister went home. I went to Newton Wellesley. And they saw that she had had a brain tumor. But they were like, it's definitely uh, non-cancerous. Don't worry. Oh, wow. It will be fine. Um, but she was like, I knew something was wrong. I knew it. Right. It had been growing for 20 years. And, and then sure enough, it wasn't. It was cancerous. And it right. was not fine. And that and so, I mean, and it just that's that's. Your whole world. Just. My whole world, yeah. And, you know, talk about at that time I was my most bitter, my most angry already. That's what I mean, and yeah. Then, and I had already dropped, so I had dropped out of high school. Um, I was Even with your grades the way they were. So at 16, I decided I was having a before quarter-life crisis, a 10th yeah. life crisis. Yeah. And, and you say, you, I don't need it. I, I need school. Well, I said, I have to start working at Children's Hospital. This was prior to my mom being diagnosed. And my parents were, I went to them and I said that and they said, what? And I said, school's stupid. There's kids that need help. I can help them. I can't do this anymore. Why am I learning about math? I had already placed out of math. I had already, like, I had already taken enough courses at that point that I would be able to. And I was like, I need, I have to do something with my life. I'm going insane. And they looked at me and they said, okay, Mm -hmm. okay. Um, And so I, they were like, take enough courses classes that you could graduate if you still want to so i went early in the morning and my teacher these teachers public school by the way yeah. worked around my schedule so like i went in i took two classes by 8 a.m and then i went to the hospital right. um and worked there until five or whatever so at at the time i was already like figuring myself out right. and but i you was did still, drop out uh, well i that's what i did i took yeah. those two that's yeah right. yeah and so for, you did it. for all of my my whole junior year. And so that was and that was then in December. My okay. mom was I was already doing that. My mom was then diagnosed. Right. So I'm already the weird kid people are looking at like what right. what's this girl's deal? She has great grades. She was like one of the cooler ki- and now she's right. leaving and, you weren't, you and weren't, she You weren't bullied or anything. No, or... no. When I was a kid, yeah, but not not in high school. No. no. I was cute enough and I had friends and I partied right. and you know there was nothing to, I Played sports. So you did, socially, it was fine. So, Grades were fine. fine. You were just you, you were just battling a lot of shit. Yeah. yeah. And at this point, my parents still had no idea what was going on with me, right. and they were just trying to figure out like how can we make this girl not so miserable? I was having like horrible panic attacks all yeah. day, scream like screaming traumas, and they would be like, "What? What can we do?" And right. I was, and so that was my solution. You were just and, screaming for help, basically. Yeah. What you were doing. Desperately. And then you do. So you work in the hospital. Your my mom's mom got diagnosed. Diagnosed and and. I doubled down on being a dick. I was just going to ask you. I was going to say, did that change you into the better? No, so I doubled down. Side. I doubled down so hard. How so? I, I was just, you know, drinking in the mornings. Like Wow. I just, I was dating a, a piece of, cr- an actual dick at the time who, I swear to God, uh, this is a different story, but this week texted me. It's okay. Been, it's been over a decade. Okay. This week texted me. I just want you to know that your mom was so amazing to me, um, and I've told you that before, but not only that, you were amazing to me, and I'm so sorry that I didn't know at the time uh, and that I was such a dick to you. I'm so sorry. You are the best. Did, uh, what, uh, we haven't spoken in like a decade. But when that text comes in, does that does, does that mean something to you, or do you, or do you say – too late. What? Oh, not to get back together. No, 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 no. no. I don't mean it that. It meant everything to me yeah. because I'm currently going through a whole, my love life is DOA, yeah. and it 
it just shows me that what you know at the time is right. Me, my gut is never has never been wrong. And I just I know it, that just made me at that time. I was like, why can't he see? I was a kid, but I was like, huh. what this? I'm amazing. Right. Why doesn't he? End? So what's, so when you say he was a dick, like what was he? What was he doing? He was cheating on was me cheating with my best friends in high school. In high what? school, okay. and like you know, he was smoking cigarettes. My mom had quit, and so then he started get, getting her to smoke again. Your mom? Yeah, okay. and so she started smoking again, which was like. He just was a bad influence. Right. He had a really bad family life, so he was living with me. He was staying over, and just like he was uh, at the time, he was pushing oxies, so he was feeding me mm. oxies. Okay. I didn't even know what they were. So like, it just he was bad. Yeah, B- bad to the bone. Bad yeah. influence. Getting robbed. And how long did you date? Fight, shoving people in lockers. He was robbing people. No, getting robbed because he was like dealing in wheels. Oh, like, I see. And, I see, I see. and I'm sure robbing people too. He was right. doing it all. He wasn't a good guy. No, right. definitely not then. And now I'm sure he's fine. But, uh, whatever. but K- back then, no, it was not good. It was really bad. Uh, and but he was a year older, so then the next year he left. Uh, and right. we, but we stayed kind of hooking up sometimes for years. Right. I I kind of hooked up with three different people for seven years. Right. Like just cycled, recycled, you recycled, had, you had, right? And you, that was you it. You always needed to be with somebody, but you, it was okay if it was somebody. somebody one did, of the three. Yep. Totally. I see, I see what you're saying. Totally. So, Although one of them was an amazing human being. Okay. But but, but neither of the first two. Neither the first two. But you, you you kind of gravitate towards not. Yeah. So I remember though I was finally I was in my senior year, and. I was the biggest dick that I had been, and my right. mom and I got into a screaming match at one in the morning in the dead of winter in the snow. As she, after her biopsy, she couldn't walk the same, so she was limping following me, and I was screaming in the street, "I, I fucking hate you!" You're the like yeah. just screaming at her. Um, the cops were called on us, and I think I was drunk, yeah. and she was. Not in her right mind. She had a brain tumor. She had um, hit me a couple of times, and we were close fist. Um, like slapped one time. She Pretty punched right. me. Yeah, it, but she was not okay. She had a sure. massive one hundred percent. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I resented her a lot for things, and you didn't get it. I didn't get it, yeah. and so we w- finally, after the police left or whatever, I went to sleep that night, and I woke up the next morning. My dad said, "Get up," and I said. What are we doing? And he said, we're going to feed the ducks, which is something we did when I was a little kid. Mm. And I'll never, ever forget. He took me to feed the ducks, and he looked at me. We we were quiet the whole ride there. It was like 25 minutes away. We get there. We get out. We're feeding them, saying nothing. We're about to leave, and he looks at me and says, if you don't change, you're never going to forgive yourself, and you don't have time. Right. So you've got to. You have to change because you, you. you'll never be able to live with yourself. But that got you because your dad was, you know, he was. And, you know, instead of being a dick for once and being like, you don't know. I just kind of I heard it. Yeah. And I thought about it. And I think it was the first time I realized we were going to actually lose her because right. I always. That, that, that makes so much sense because it probably you were in such denial. A hundred percent. And I was like, you know, I don't know when, but we're going to lose her. Right. And so. Yeah, everything changed for me after that. It was that one conversation. And With the he, ducks. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I asked him last year, Dad, do you remember? Because all of a sudden I realized he probably has no idea. Right. And, you know, for all the weird parenting moves he's done, that was like on. That was the one. That was the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, I wonder if he even knows. And he said, I don't remember that. Wow. Yeah, I don't remember that. But was, that you know what's so great about that, though, is that. To him, it's just like inst- instinct to just let you know it's just a normal day. Like, hey, get your shit together. Yeah, this is but it. to me, it changed my whole life. Right. My whole life. And not just with my mom. I just was like, I hate who I am. And you turned it around. And if I don't change, I'm I'm going to hate myself forever. Yeah, and I, I turned it around, and I started dating this great guy. Okay, one of the three. Yeah, the, the third one the of third the three. The third good one, okay. Uh, who changed my life, and he was so amazing and to this day, I actually just saw him for Thanksgiving, um, and he he's the best. Yeah. I I love him. He changed my whole world, not in that How long kind did you of date way. Him? We were together. I mean, on and off for like the seven years. He yeah. came and visited me, and then college, and then afterwards. But he lived in New York, and finally we called it quits, and we were like, neither of us just are ever moving. Yeah, yeah. We we can't do this long distance. Neither of us are going to move. Right. Um, but it was amicable. 
yeah and he's still a good friend of mine and and he's he wasn't the right person for me in the end but he was the right person for you for me, as a friend i needed him yes and he and he he really did like he changed my life I started seeing a therapist who also changed my life, at, and I at would, the same time for after the duck conversation. I would not be here without her. She was everything to okay. me, uh, and I just was like, you know, I doubled down on schoolwork. I was like, I've got to graduate, so I started taking extra classes because I had missed my but, junior but you year. Went, but you went back to senior. Went back. Right. Um, I started auditioning for schools. That's how I got into USC because yep. I auditioned in their program, but I was flying all over the country. My mom couldn't go with me, so I was just by myself like doing it and right. just kind of being an adult, but actually this time not like 12-year-old trying to be. I was like, okay. But I you kicked, seems like you kicked into the Roxy I know today because what people may or may not have heard me talk about this, you were one of the most prepared people that I've ever met in my life. Like when we – when the first time I ever had you on Schmoes, you wanted to know what the show was about. You did all the research. When we want to put you on the DC movie news show, you did all the research. Yeah. You learned. And that seems like this person that flew to USC. Yeah, but it took a long time. Yeah. You know, it started then. Right. It started then. But I still – I couldn't repair what I had done with my sister because she hated me so much. I couldn't repair with my brother yet. They, but were, I, they wouldn't take your phone calls and stuff too? They, they, they didn't were, want to deal with it? They just didn't want to deal with it. Yeah. They didn't want to deal with it. Like, it, they weren't – they didn't hate me anymore. They just didn't want to deal with my right. crap. Right. Like, they didn't believe that I had changed yet, which why would they? Right. And they didn't want to deal with it, which I totally get. My sister was a, an actual child, and my brother was just like, leave me alone. You're right. annoying and the worst. Right. Um, but I was able to repair my relationship with my mom, which was – Well, that's, that's what I was going to ask you. So at that point, you know, because you, you have – the conversation with your dad, it turns it all around. You're going to the USC. Now, at what point do you, what's the conversation like with your mom when you say, look, I know more or less I've been a dick? There was no conversation. No conversation. There was no conversation. Just feeling? She loved me so much, okay. and she was just so happy that I just was not being a dick anymore. Mm. Uh, but, you know, I still had my moments, and like I'll, I'll also never forget, like, she, I mean, I, I don't know if she was totally there. For, she, I know she wasn't totally there for this, but who knows how much she knows like three days before she died, I I went to UMass to party with the great the older kids, mm -hmm. and went and stayed there. I was supposed to come home, didn't come home. Like, j just was still fighting being yeah. the old me. But, was that also you trying to get away from it? Yeah, I think yeah. so. And I remember I was at SC at this time. Mm -hmm. So, but when she passed, I was at SC. I was flying home almost every weekend. I, wow. I was considered a commuter student. Jeez. From because USC she looked at me and she was like, "You drop out, I kill you." Yeah. And so I stayed, but it was getting really bad with her. So I just flew back and forth and back Every and forth. Weekend. It yeah. was all, it was three times a month. It's um, a lot, yeah. It was a lot. It's a long flight. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, you know, it's a six hour flight. Mm -hmm. So, but I, she told me I couldn't drop out, and I didn't want to, and I wanted to be with her, and I just, yeah, I just did it as much as I could. So all right, so then you're. As it gets closer to, you know, when your mom passes, do you are you guys expe expecting that it was coming? It was like you said, it just happens fast. So she, she lost her ability to uh, speak, and then it's like that, yeah. you know. So until then, she was pretty good at faking it. Like I could, t she had all these things. Like she'd be like, "Oh, that's my favorite song," and it's like, yeah. "No, it's not," or "That's my favorite color." No, it's not. You yeah. know, she like lost who she was. But then when she lost her ability to speak. We and then move. We would carry her everywhere we were going, outside, indoor, whatever. Like it physically very, very demanding and exhausting. Um, and yeah, it happened really fast. And then I remember from my, the last time she ever spoke, it was my birthday, which was July thirteenth. And um, that was the last time. Yeah, wow. and because all day, I don't know why it was so important to my sister and I, but all day, we were like, we're gonna get her to say. Uh, happy birthday, I love you. Just like we've just we we needed to. Yeah. I don't know. And so makes sense. Like but like a little you know, like a kid who's learning to speak would be like, Can you say, can you whatever? Uh and finally after like twelve hours of us being there, she looked up and she said, Happy birthday, I love you and she never spoke again. That's I'll tell you though, same thing I told John Roca when he told me when he shared his experience with his dad. That right there that moment like you always have that i'll always have that you will always have that that is such a when you when you can talk about all those memories to where you said like you know i felt like i was being a dick but it's because you turned that moment around and because you have that now I know. and you could tell how hard she was fighting to do it because yeah, she, she knew we it. wanted something but right. she couldn't figure it out and then finally at the end when she did 
Uh, yeah, and then it was two weeks, three weeks almost later that she passed. But I'll tell you, though, the thing is that, I mean, again, what do I know just from hearing these stories? You, what you said to me that is a key element is that it was you and your sister all day, right? Yeah. And your mom saw that. Your mom saw that it was you and your sister together. She did. I don't know. At that at that point, my sister and I were on the mend. We were not good. Like now, I literally, she's, I talked to her 14,000 times right. a day. Like, but what I mean is it's the memory. Your mom, though, you know. She saw that we were she okay. She saw it. She, saw, we okay. she saw you guys together and, and trying to work together. So, I mean, that, yeah. you know, so. But now, sure. now you have these moments that you have that, like you said, there were a couple moments that between the diagnosis and because of the thing that happened to you, and, and also with your grandmother, that these these three moments turned you more into a dick. But after your mom passes, and you're already in this mode where you're on the mend of becoming a different person, does the anger s- seep back in, or do you 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 keep going forward? You know, all uh, both. It wasn't anger anymore. I was just not a full human being anymore. Like, this is when I, I've talked about it on Collider a few times. Like, I've just blacked out a lot of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was I was really, really depressed. I was in school still. I had to finish. I was working full time, too. Uh, and three days after my mom passed, I was back in L.A. for class. So right. I, you Do know. people know? I told pretty much no one. My roommates knew. Right. Um, not even all of my roommates knew. And they had known she'd been sick. I don't think anybody else realized my mom was going to die right. because I had been so not as open with low key about, yeah. you know, everybody. I don't mean this to sound insulting at all, but everybody's got a parent with cancer and 90 and percent of them make it. So it's like when you hear that somebody's parent has cancer, it's not the same thing that it used to be 40 years ago where it's like, you know, when when you hear somebody's parent has breast cancer, you think, oh, my God, that's horrible. What you're going through is horrible. But you're never thinking they're going to die, you know. So when I said my parent has cancer, people weren't thinking she's going to die. They were just. I think so, though. I mean, I think sometimes with cancer, it's like I, every time I hear that, I just want to know right away, like, what kind? Is it terminal? Like, what, what's what's as happening? A, as an adult, yes. Because but I'm saying as a 16-year-old, we everybody had right. had an uncle I or, a, you know. Right, 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 and right, right, again, right. I'm so sorry if I offend anybody. I don't mean it like that at all. All cancer is horrible. And I'm the first I know person to say, mean. fuck cancer. I know what you you're, you're, when you're When you're a kid, you're, you're a little more naive to no, it because you still have that immortality. It's so different. Like, the, brain cancer is the worst of the worst. Right. And people think of cancer as cancer. You don't think of it as... You know, you think of this thing that I thought of it at the time, at least, as because I had lived through seven people surviving cancer. Right. So it's like this thing that people fight and it's miserable and it changes them and it's horrible, right. but they make it. Right. It's, right. I, I know what you're saying now. Yeah, for sure. And but uh, and I think that that's but at the time, though, the guys in New York, the one that you really like the, 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 or, the, mm-hmm. or the one who is the good guy. Yeah. Um, are you confiding in him? So he lived. When you mean after she passed? After she passed. Yeah. Yeah. Because he knew her. Right. That's what I meant. So well. And she loved him. It was really, really hard for me to ever be with anybody again that never met her because it feels like, how could you ever know me if you didn't know her? Right. Uh, You know, but you you have to try. But yeah, I leaned on him a lot and and he was a, a rock. So there's so much in there already within this time that we talked um, that I've learned about shaping who I'm looking at here today. <laughs> and there's more. I mean, there's more to it. Where Because where I first met you, I met you through Kevin Undergaro and Maria Menounos. Mm-hmm. Now, I, you know this story obviously better than I do because it happened to you. But the the from what I always knew is that you were on a plane mm-hmm. and you were sitting next to Kevin. And you guys started talking. And then the next thing, you know, you're, you're working an after bus. So I had seven dollars in my bank account. Yeah. At the time. Where were you? You graduated college at this point? No. No. I was still in college. Okay. Uh, at early college, I was a freshman. Okay. So, mom's early. still around. Oh, your mom's still around. So okay. My mom okay. was still around. Okay. Still early college, uh, and I was like a broke college kid, and I had I was hungry, and I went and I fought my way. To first class because I was hungry and I knew seven dollars wouldn't get me food on the airplane and right. first class got free food and so I just went and badgered the shit out of the people at the counter and I was like listen I see the seat is open I just finally they were like just do it just fine just right. s- just shut up about it and do right. it so I sit next to Kevin wow and so I like wor- 
that's the only the only time I was in first class. Like, right. and that and that was that. So I turned to him. He has a whole camera crew walking by him. I'm like, oh my god, who is this guy? I'm right. out here to be an actress. We talk. He ends up auditioning me for After Buzz as their first host. But don't 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 bury the lead there because that's a long. It's because you're going from where to Boston. Yeah, to, Boston, LA. Six, six hours. It's a six hour flight. So we it's watched, not just like a hello. We watched a couple hours of Family Guy together. Okay. And you we, start talking with him. You bring up. You, yeah, I oh, said. Yeah. I said, uh, who was that? Like the crew that walked by. He talked to me about how he was filming his movie Adventures of Serial Buddies at yep. the time. And then he just started talking to me about his partner Maria Menounos, who I had no idea who that was. Oh, you didn't. Okay. Which is shocking because every person and their mother in Boston knows who That's that is. Right, right. But I was, I was not that girl. I didn't grow up. No, I didn't. No, it doesn't seem like it at all. Yeah, you, you weren't. You, you I kn- kind of fell into this business. Yeah, I knew rock and roll, right. and like I knew my favorite performances, and I had seen so many movies and TV shows. But like the entertainment side of it all, yeah. I didn't know extra access e. Like I just, I didn't w- read people or any of those. That just wasn't me growing up, and so. Yeah, he starts talking to me, and he was like, you know, um, I know you're out here to be an actress, but we're starting, possibly starting this company. Maybe you should come by. And I was like, we were talking about, I wanted to audition with the real world. Yeah. And he was like, I'll help you with your audition video. And so I was like, yeah, okay, then I'll come by. Now, when you when you hear it too, because I mean, I know Kevin; he's he's one hundred percent legit. But you're talking to this guy on a plane. Do you think that this could be bullshit at all? Oh, or of you, course! Yeah. I can't Google anything because I'm on the plane, and right. and he's named a name I didn't know. Right. right. So it, I was like, well, who is this? Who Whatever. Is, but right. it helped me with my real world audition. So fine. Right. Right. So you be, so you believe it? Obviously, then you do Google him. Are you wait, are you on the way? Are you? I'm sorry. Were you I'm on, on the way, my way to from Boston, Boston, Boston to, to LA. LA? Okay. Okay. So then you get back to school. You do the Google search. You realize. Okay, he's definitely legit. Yeah. Um, and then you go into the audition. And the second I saw her face, I knew who she was. Right. And I felt like an idiot too. Right. But I probably helped that you did that you didn't know. To yeah. Be honest. I I did that, and then my I didn't have a car out here at the time, so my grandparents came and picked me up at USC and drove me to what is the old After Buzz. Mm-hmm. But at the time, it was not that; it was just a little house, Love and that it house. was so bizarre that my grandparents were like, "We're walking you inside, right. like you're gonna be sold into sex right, slavery right, or something." Right, right, and right. I was like, and, "And it's in the valley," and they're like, "You know what happens in the valley?" So I don't know, but right. they walked me in. And I'm with a suitcase of clothes for my real world audition. And they walked me in. They met Kevin. And they were like, yeah, okay. He seems legit. Fine. They left. He sat with me for like three hours while we filmed my real world audition. Um, After I filmed it, I got called in. So I was like, oh, he must have done a good job. And so then when he... When we went back east again, we were both back there for the holidays. At Emerson, he was like, we're going to do our first episode of... Uh, Jersey Shore. Do you want to come after show? The after yeah. show, but it was at Emerson at the, whatever. And he was like, "Do you want to pop by and do it with us?" And I was back home, and I was like, "Go get drunk with my friends. Go do this." Mm, all right, I guess I'll show up. Like, and right. so I did. Different and, Roxy, already. Totally, yeah. I did. And then everything just like from there. Isn't that crazy though? How like you can just like because there are a lot of people that that don't do that shift. The, we'll call yeah. it the, the duck shift. Right? I don't think I ever would have shifted if I wasn't forced to shift. That's what I mean. Like, uh, well, yeah, yeah, and, and but I mean, but well, it's tricky though because it, it's also a different mental. You, there's some people that just doesn't matter. Even if you're forced to shift, some people so just don't shift. You go one way or the other. Right. I, I have a tattoo on my shoulder that says "better not bitter" because that was like our family mantra, um, and it's from a letter my mom wrote me in her handwriting. Mm. But they, my dad always used to say, just like you can't, just. There's nothing worse than becoming bitter from the events that are happening in your life that right. you can't control. You you have to make let them make you better, and at some point that finally sunk in. Right, and it, well, it seemed to be the that ducks. for sure because you still got you still got that feistiness. I think that's what makes you you. I'm definitely feisty still, but I'm a and not to not to be a dick, but I'm a really good person. Yeah, like I look out for my friends and family like no other. I feel like a lot of it is making up for lost time, and and, and whether I think she knows or not. It's all about doing it for my mom. Every single thing I do. Um, I don't know if you feel that same way since your brother has yeah. passed, but like, you just want to make them proud. You want to be successful. You want to be a good person. You want to do the things you told them that you would do that they always thought you would. Right. Uh, and it's just all I think about. Right. All day. Well, and that so that that's been that's there. You get to, so this audition comes in. You, you don't get it, but who gives a shit? Because you got the actual yeah. you got the actual audition. I had to go to Bakersfield Hooters. 
Amazing. for my callback. Yeah, you don't need the show anyway. So yeah. you're so you then but but it's what's well, really the the big thing is you're you're getting involved with Kevin and, and Afterbuzz mm-hmm. here. So and then when you are you're doing that, you do the after show here for Jersey Shore, and then but it's so much more than that because when you come back, when I met you, you were like one of the people that were running the place it was Phil and Steven and then yeah. you. And so w- did you mean when I was done with college or I was still in school? I, don't I even met remember. you probably in 2014. So we're after college. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I had done, I was doing after shows there all through college and um, still studying acting and film at SC. And then when I graduated, they brought me on as a producer, which Gosh, I don't know what they were seeing in me is that at the time, but it. It, thank goodness that I figured it out. And so I just started learning everything. I learned Final Cut and I learned how to, you know, on um, um, movies and framing yeah. and what, whatever it was. But are I just you clashing with anybody there? Are you actually yeah, I, able to? No, I clashed with everybody. <laughs> I clashed with everybody because yeah. I, for better or worse, I love them to pieces, but a lot of the staff at Afterbus is a bunch of nerds right. and I'm nerdy in a different way, but like they're like tech people. Right. And I was this like partying rock stars rock, kid. Yeah. Rock, rock, and yeah. They, they just did. I didn't get them. They didn't get me and I loved them, but I was just like, you know, they, they would talk about things. And I'd be like, what? That's right. human. I, f- I felt like I always had to be like for dummies, please. Like right. what the f- did you just say? Uh, so I clashed with, Everyone, right? I clashed with literally everyone there. Are they like family to you? And All now, them. yeah. Now, after a decade, right. but yeah, right. I was clashing with everybody. Well, and it's funny you say that because I, you talk about like what we always talked about with the Schmoes crew is that when we came in there. So for those people who don't know, basically what happened is that Maria and Kevin came on to the Schmoes show in 2013, and Kevin had told me he's like she's done so many of her shows. This is her favorite show that she's ever done, um, and I was like, that's like. That's so cool. It was a huge compliment. It was great. And then we were looking for a home after Toad Hop went away. And so Kevin and I started talking. And I was like, you know, I don't want to put it on After Buzz. I want to keep it on Schmoes. And he's like, no, what you do is we'll we'll put it on your channel, but we'll have it from the After Buzz Studios. And that was our home, but it was very different. After Buzz wasn't doing that. The only thing After Buzz was doing was all their shows. And then here comes this one renegade show mm-hmm. on Thursday nights for two hours or so of these people that are not part of the family, but it's just like these kind of random... That left their trash everywhere. That's bullshit. That was such... That you was guys such, did. That, you no, left the studio an absolute mess. We never did that. We always cleaned up. Ken was the one who always made sure it was clean. And After was we like, complained, Ken's the best. It's not true. It's not true. But we were like... We looked... We were... So I can't remember. It may have been Sarah Stratton who said that we looked... We were like the the unkempt uh, rock stars of the... Of, yeah. Of, because we were getting... We are pulling in... The, Serious views. Yeah, huge um, numbers. And it was one of those things. And so when you hear of this show coming in, what's your initial, what's your first thought? You know, I I thought that you guys were, I, I didn't know wh- who you were. And I, so I was skeptical because right. East Coast. So just like, mm, what do they want? What are they doing? Right. Uh, and then you guys were loud and messy. I don't care what it's you say. True. And I got in that fight with Ken about the red light being on versus not being on because he came to tell me to be quiet and I was like, put the red light on or what, which means that you're on air. And I don't know. I probably thought you guys were a bunch of dick bags, but I I didn't care. I didn't care because Kevin and Maria were so into the idea because you guys were doing really well and she had loved her time on your show. Right. So I was like, all right, whatever. And then that day comes. I don't even know how it happened, but I remember Alicia was out for the day. And I don't know, and I remember where and Tiff com- was gone or something. Tiff, yeah, Tiffany had been kind of in and out, and I and I don't know how it came up, but Ken and I on were the tree. To- you don't remember this part. What is it? Tell me. We met at the tree. I remember this. I remember where we met. We remember because we had this that tree in in like the, the West Hollywood. Well, Hollywood. Park. Yes, and there was this whole thing, but that but that wasn't that wasn't you didn't win me over there because I was just oh, like I thought I did. Now you were being an asshole that day. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, it, it was Maybe maybe that's how I first met you, but maybe that's how I suggested you to Ken or Ken. I can't remember, but I said but the bottom line is that Roxy came in and, and hosted, and you did exactly what I said previously. The research was there, and I was just like, whoa, she is. This is a professional. She was 23, 24, yeah. I'm like, but she's, I mean, this is someone who's taking this seriously. She was like a and a episode or whatever it was, and you just fit like a glove. Um, and you I guys like, brought me in a few times after that. Yeah. It was so cool. And I remember that was a massive game changer for my career because you saw me. It was different. It was the first thing I had done that was not after Buzz. Right. 
And I, I had never thought of, I was doing after buzz because Kevin put me on and I was like, oh, he's probably doing it to me as a favor. But that was the first time that I was like, maybe I'm good at this. Like maybe people like me. I'm not sure, but right. maybe I could go for this. Somehow. Well, you hung with a crew that had been together for a while. That, yeah, that, that's what people don't realize. How it's not it's not easy to do. Like there are people that have come onto whether it's like Collider Live or whether it's uh, Schmo's the iteration of it. Even and, Brett talks about like he missed one month and coming back. It's it's hard. It's tough because especially if you're sitting in the seat. And I think that the after buzz after buzz the uh, the afterthoughts guys call it um, the curse of the third chair. Right. There are times that people have been sitting with, with when it was Mar- Mark and myself. They're in that chair. You got to pick your moments, and you got to be able to move in there, or you'll get buried. Because Mark and I just have that chemistry. We've been there for a long time. But also know that you're in the third chair. Exactly, and you did that brilliantly. And I think that that's why we had you come back. And I think that's why we also kept a conversation. And like Kevin and Kevin and I, or we're we're real good now. And like there's you're anytime you're working with somebody, there's either you don't see eye to eye on certain things. And that was that that happened for a thing with us. And I always thought that you thought maybe that's why they're not you know you're not on the show or anything too but it was just kind of a different why I wasn't on Schmoes yeah I think there was a time that you were just it was just it was just weird at one point because then we transitioned into leaving and we went into 2016 we moved over to Collider but we we split really well with Kevin and Maria and everything too and like I said have a great relationship with them now but I think you got involved again because then we because I know between Ken's relationship because I had gotten Ken the job at Screen Junkies yeah then he got you hooked up over Screen Junkies yeah yeah so all of that I think is true Everything you just said, like where we are now, like I've talked about in life, things change and mold yeah. and it sometimes things take time. Kevin is my, like my person. He's done. He you started still do me. Show I still. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The tomorrow show. I, I'm I owe him more than anybody I owe right. in my life. Right. Like he because he's a mentor. He's a friend. He has he's started my career. But you also have done huge, crazy things for my career. And, um, yeah, I'm just really glad that I'm able to work with both of you guys, and you guys are good. But then Ken, leave it to Ken, who I know from you, who I know from Kevin. Right, right. Ken comes in and was like, yeah, there's this thing that people have been tweeting your name out for, TV fights, um, and I think I can get you an audition. Would you want to come in to audition? And I was like, oh, my God, this is right. this is my f- first uh I wonder if that was my. Fr- I had done some paid hosting stuff, like one-offs, but right. that was would have been my one. first yeah. consistent weekly year contract. It was a Wasn't year it contract between you and Roca. So, it was it was down to I believe it was between Kathy Kelly, Roca, wow. and myself. Look at that. Okay. Uh, by the way, she got the better end of uh, of that ass. deal. Just <laughs> had her on. Yeah. She's so good. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Ken messaged me about it, and I was like, I can't let him down. He already told me I'm like. Not the front runner for this, but I'm going to come in. So they they asked us to bring in 10 TV fight questions. So I brought in 200. Wow. And like just. That was it. Yeah. Totally. They were like, okay, well, this girl can produce, so she'll take work off our plate. So I don't think I was better than the other people. I was probably worse, but they were like. No, that includes better, though. But that, if, you're, yeah. if you're greener, you've got to make up for it somewhere yeah. else. And I knew that because how am I going to go against people that, you know, Roke has been at this for way longer than me. Oh, uh, I don't think so. Really? I think you've been. I think well, he's been at life longer than me. <laughs> That's true. Uh, That's true. Yeah. He. I don't know if he handled the situation perfectly gracefully, though. But why was know, he get upset? From what I've heard, he gets upset. From what I've heard, he was not particularly thrilled. I yeah, he's, it. he's a competitive guy, as we found out over the years. Oh for yeah. Sure. But you, yeah. But you got it. I did. I got it, and I honestly didn't know what to do with it. Yeah. I was like, wow. Uh, and I was nervous and awkward. And Ken like coached me through it and did an amazing job being my producer right. and, and friend. Which was really important because I needed to feel like I'm part of this whole new platform. Right, this with the Screen Junkies Plus. Plus. Yeah. I walk in there and I'm by far and away, like, you know, Alicia Malone is there and Jeremy Johns and Chris Stuckman. Right. And I'm like. Getting thrown and, into it. Yeah. And uh, Black Nerd. And I'm like, who, who the F am I? Like, right. what? Uh, okay. And I have. My, and it's a spin off of their very popular show, Movie Fights. And yeah. now it's TV Fights. And there's right. a lot of eyes on me. And I, I was like, wow, okay. Well, they think I can do it. Yeah. Uh, and that was only a few years ago. Yeah. I mean, that was four years ago now or whatever. So Nuts. That, that, that goes out Three or four years. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. Uh, and then everything kind of just started falling in place. Well, when all, oh, okay, I thought you were going to say falling apart, but falling in place. Oh, p- no, fall, definitely that, too. When, when, all, when all the shit went down, did you just kind of stay away from it or did you just wait to hear kind of what was going on with the show? Uh, are you talking about Andy Signore stuff? Yeah. Well, 
You know, I think I'm still the only person to this day who did not tweet about the situation that worked there. Okay. You wanted to kind of stay, see what happened first before? It's not It's not that. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, you know, uh, truthfully, uh, I'm going to be honest with yeah. you. Truthfully, what happened was I was waiting for somebody from Defy to reach out to me before I gave my statement on Twitter. I was waiting for somebody to reach out to me. Here's what you should say publicly. That no, kind of thing? no. Are you okay? Oh. What happened to you? Oh. Because I'm one of two women women that worked for him as a host. Oh, right. Just to see if anything happened also inside of it. Did anything happen? Ever happen? I, I de- definitely did not not happen. Oh, wow. Um, I didn't and know that. so I was waiting. Okay. And it never came. Oh, wow. And I didn't want to tweet something before I talked to them. And I, it never came. Wow. So, so you're not surprised at the fire shut down? Oh, God, no. Right. Um, I remember somebody from Screen Junkies finally called me, and they said, are you okay? Is everything okay? And I said, honestly, not really. And they said, wow, I'm so sorry to hear that. I'll make sure somebody from Defy contacts you. And it, they never did. Never did. Well, that's why Screen Junkies is still alive and living at a, yeah. you know, and random I'm, and I'm Defy's f- toast. I'm fine, and it was like it's not fine, but you know, I was not sexually uh, assaulted by him in the way that um, other people have come forward. And but there were there were things that happened that through the years that I spoke about and was like really, you know, I didn't speak about publicly, but uncomfortable. Is that more? More than uncomfortable. Okay. Really inappropriate. Okay. Um, and I was just waiting. This is the first time I've ever said anything. Yeah, this is I, the first I, time I've ever been asked about I, it. I had no idea. I yeah, nev- yeah. Literally, I just kept waiting for somebody to ask me. Okay. Kind of like earlier in the conversation, you know, going back for one second, yeah. talking about when I was 14. I'm not a liar, so I'm never going to – somebody asks me something, I'm never going to say something didn't happen. Right. But you wait your whole – like, I'm just somebody who kind of waits for somebody to ask me because I'm always going to tell the truth – but I'm not gonna just come out and say something that could hurt the company when they don't get the, cho- the chance to talk to me about it first. Right, and then no one. But, that but then never nobody came. never came. Right. So wow. I see that I did not know. I didn't yeah, know. Never I, came. See, I knew. I knew that you were. I, I knew that they never. That the call never came. I didn't know anything ever inappropriate as far as conversation or whatever happened to. Yeah, he was a sup- super super inappropriate guy. Okay. Uh, and, you know. I have very, very not nice things to say about him. Okay. Which it, it seems like get in line. So, you know. My well, yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. I, again, I don't know. I mean, from what, if, there's just a lot out there at this moment, too. Yeah. And um, yeah. so I don't I don't want to put you in a position of where, again, you know, as far as legally and all that kind of yeah, stuff happens, that's, too. I, I that's know. another thing. I was like, I don't want to, you know, I, I spoke off off air individually to some of the people who had come forward yeah. to let them know that they were not uh, alone if things like if legal ramifications came or whatever, but that I would not be coming public with my story um, unless someone asked in, you. Unless I in so, unless somebody asked me. Literally, those were my words. Yeah. Unless I'm asked. Wow, and no one asked you. And ever. no one ever asked me. That's crazy. Crazy. I'm one it, of two on air women you had, and they never asked if anything ever happened. Yeah, that's insane. That's insane. Well, it's it is and it isn't now that you know kind of that they that they're gone. Um, but it also, like you said, doesn't surprise me that somebody from Screen Junkies reached out because they're still and they are, care about me and they're good people. And he yeah. had heard through the grapevine, so he reached out just like yeah, just just making sure. And I was like, actually, you know, I'm not. <laughs> it, right. It just was That's unbelievable. Well, but you I, think I'm, I should keep waiting, or you don't think that they're? Gonna, I don't think they're gonna, they're gonna call. Not you. Gonna call. No, I don't think so. Got I think a couple things going yeah, on. Yeah, a lot of. They probably have to call the bank first. Um, but now you're uh, you're besides besides all that though too the it's still you're great on the show. The show had a nice cult following for sure. TV fights. TV fights. Um, but then, yeah, tough to build behind a paywall. It, it's just hard. I mean, I, I had Dan Merle on. And we talked about it for a while too. I think my. my my thing with that with that service was that it just uh, I never understood why you'd put panel talks behind a paywall when you could see panel talks anywhere. Um, I get it that you know Chris Stuckman and Johns and and different things, but it's like I just never understood the model. I think when they started making original um, content, even though they, they did the the agents of field stuff and everything too, even though they didn't necessarily go over oh, all yeah. the fans. 
I think that to me that's more that's, conceptually you get it. Yes, that to me makes more of a sense of, of what you're trying to do. I just never st- understood why people would pay extra for panel shows yeah. when you already have. It's also different when you're you know if you've built up a following to then put it behind a paywall. But when there's no following for any of the shows, brand new shows, br- it's just it was tough. Yes, it and was it, tough. But and the fans were amazing that were there yeah. because they're the diehards. They were diehards and they were loyal. And I remember a lot of people like that were that would have conversations about it and they were very active. And I did a few of those of those shows. Um, but the, re- regardless, you you get your feet wet there. You, you, mm-hmm. you hold. You do that show, um, and then you do a lot of freelancing stuff. Um, I mentioned this show yeah. to you. Uh, two years show. ago, maybe. Yeah, the Collider Live, about a year and a half ago, whatever, too, because I knew that once the Schmo show was kind of going, because I, you know, I've told, and I've been on pretty upfront with this, and I told Ellis, and we've had this conversation, I was kind of fallen out of love with the Schmo show for a while towards towards the end of it. I just didn't think it was vibing the same way, and I, was, I wasn't I was on it for a while, and, and we, Mark and I just kind of agreed that we just kind of start doing the Harloff and Ellis thing and, and let us kind of mo- move on. Um, but then as the conversation started with Fernandez about what about like the Schmo show here? And I was like, I don't know about that. I was like, what do we do? Like a, something here? Because we Collider Live was, was something that we were doing with the with these screenings. And I was like, why don't we just call it Collider Live? It's one what are you pointing at? The Collider Live sign. Oh. That, that Collider Live, that, that's, from, that's not from this. That's from a sh- Back to the Future screening that we did. But the series oh. was called Collider Live. And I said, well, uh-huh. look, we're going to be live and it's just going to be all the personalities and I said I just want to do a show to where I don't want to just talk about movies like if we don't talk about movies I don't it'd be great let's just do a show and I said but I need Roxy because the original idea of what I wanted to do I wanted to do it in a but it was going to be the desk where the main thing was was out of the way it was just going to be my desk and then across from me was you um no excuse me Towards where the curtain is with the schmo down, that would be where you are. And then over the, our guest couch would be right in front of me. And then we'd have like, you know, where the people sit to watch the schmo down? Like that would be where the crew hung, hung out. I thought of like doing like a really big kind of Howard Stern thing. But I got to say, I still really like that. I like it too, but the production behind it was was too much. Yeah. Um, and I I would have, they, they, they thought about it. It was only going to be once a week. And I was like, well, we could do the podcast because they said, can you do it in here? I said, we can do it in here, but it's got to be. You know, I, I want to do it longer. I want to do it two hours a day. Um, still want Roxy to be co-host, and you know, and um, and I just w- we have to just kind of build it. And I think eventually, if we can ever get to that place, luckily enough, we're doing a hundred thousand views an episode. Then we'll probably five days a week. I don't want to do five days. Oh, a what week. were you we gonna say? I was gonna say that maybe we can do that big oh. uh, studio idea. I mean, I want to get out of here eventually because I think the show. Deserves Why are we it. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? Why aren't we Monday, Wednesday, Friday? Um, two reasons. One, because I feel like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday are the best for like news, and and I think people are on the top of their game on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Thursday is also Jedi Council. Uh, I don't really want to come here and work in the morning on Fridays. And I also looked at like you know the Howard Stern model, and he does Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and they do. And because now, because the Afterthoughts is one of the main reasons I wanted to move Afterthoughts over to the Collider Live feed because it's the after show for. Yeah, so it's alive. like having four a week, almost. and then we have four shows a week, you know. So, but that's you know that's you just what, made them so happy to hear that. Well, I'm glad that they. I, I like those guys. I really do. I, you know, I, some, me too. I won't Especially ring one the, of them. <laughs> real nice. Um, but and and that's kind of an ongoing bit. But that's. Do you when when I asked you to be part of the Clara Live? Um, yeah. Do you, any hesitation? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Uh, uh, Truthfully, right, so well, that's why I'm asking. A couple of reasons. Um, you and I had had an issue not because of you or I prior to with uh what was it? with TV talk. What did we have? What was our issue? I don't remember. Tell me. You don't remember? No, tell me. I probably I don't, remember. I don't think I can tell you on air. You can't tell me on air? We what was promised to me and oh, promised oh, to oh, you. Oh, oh, oh I see, I see. Because TV talk T V I'm thinking T V fights. Uh no, no, TV talk. T V talk, I understand. There was we yeah. were, yes, because we were gonna do we, we were gonna do an iteration of T V talk where you were hosting for a lot of it mm-hmm. and, and back in the day and it just it just it didn't pan out business wise. Yeah, business yes. wise it did not pan out. Yes. Um and it was a little messy. Yes, I definitely hundred percent remember that. Yes. And I think that it it soured my taste a little bit mm. and also I felt very bad because I think that uh, Makuka was upset with me because of that. And yeah. so, you know, it just changed the dynamic a little bit. And then when you were talking about 
This, it changed also from being a morn, uh, nighttime thing right. once a week to a morning thing three times right. a week, which is different, different commitment levels. Yep. Um, and, you know, at, also when we talked about it, you guys were moving to Beverly Hills, Beverly Hills yeah. which is where I lived. Yep. And then you guys were here. So it just changed. Like right. my hesitation came from logistics. Well, you know what I did? I gave you a taste. Yes. Yeah. Once you got a taste, you were locked. Yeah. Well, actually, I gave you a taste because I was like, you know what? I'm going to do these first few episodes. Well, for, yeah, yeah. But I, but I, as tastes, I always knew I wanted you though. And I knew I wanted to be a part yeah. of it. It was not none of my hesitation ever came from hosting a co-hosting a show with you. Right. It all came. You never from worried like, about how the vibe was going to be. No, because no. Right. I guess no, just because no. No. Because uh, anytime we've ever interacted, right. so Snelling's wrong. We could hang out. Yes, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Right, right, and right. we do. And like that's why like if we're at a screening and I'm there and you're there at times, yeah. we'll sit next to each other, we'll right. hang because I like you. Like I want to spend time with you because right. you're my friend. Right. So no, I wasn't worried ever about that. But I, and actually one of my questions for you, which I'll save till sure. later, has to do with it though. But like you just work with a ton of your friends and that's very challenging. It is. There's it's no very challenging. It. Yeah. Um and we'll get to that in a second too, because do got to wrap it up in a second, but I would be. I know the fans would be um, be like, "Well, oh, they didn't even bring that up once." Um, you mentioned it briefly. Um, you said that your relationship life is uh, DOA. is DOA. Um, we have mentioned it yeah. many times. My good friend, um, friend of of the show, friend of the Schmodown, Ben Bateman. He's been my best friend for years. Very long time. Um, yeah. Can we say what the official status of the relationship is? Yeah, I mean, because it's not a secret. Yeah. So uh, Ben and I had been together for almost three and a half years, and it's no secret to people that we, for the last eight months, have been struggling. Uh, and this month, Ben decided that he, well, part of it was mutual and part of it was not, that he needed to leave Yeah. Uh, because we live together. So, I mean, leave, like, our home. So we're not together. Um, I don't know what the future holds. I'm very, very much in love with him. Yeah. Uh, I believe he's very, very much in love with me. So that's very challenging for yeah. us. And it's sad. Honestly, that I feel nothing but sad about it. And I love him and, and have not a bad word to say about him. And that's why I bring this up because the reason why this conversation started when I um we, we were at a screening together and we were talking about it and we both brought up you brought up you know the passing of your mom I brought up the passing of my of my brother and then we talked about how this situation felt like a loss and and it's, it's a mourning and because yeah. I because I, I and I'll be completely transparent with everybody here too I I I had conversations with Roxy and Ben and I don't I don't when they're ready, if they are ever ready to talk about the extent of their relationship, then then that day will come. This wasn't this isn't about to dive in, into into that. It's just it's to relate to loss because that's yeah. really what we've been talking about in this particular. Gosh, episode. it's hard. I mean, and you know, people will message me, and I've seen this on Twitter or on Clyder Live or whatever, being like, you know, he probably left you because you're a bitch, and it's like, right. I I'm. I can't possibly explain to you guys how, or to you, Christian, or whoever's listening, how emotionally devastated I am right now. Yeah. Like getting up and, and I, I play no games. I don't have it left in me anymore. Right. So, you know, some people would say, you know, go on there and say, you're doing amazing. He's probably listening. So I, I don't want to. And he knows. And he knows. Yeah. I, I professionally had just about as great of a week that week, which we, we broke up two weeks ago, yeah. as I possibly could have with my face being next to Sharon Osbourne's on Huffington Post, people, the Ron Perlman interview, like everything right, right. just, I was um, asked by Doug Benson to go on his show, which I've been trying to do for years. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. just everything kept landing. And so professionally, I'm fine. And that's and that's great. But when there's a hole in your heart, there's nothing out. You can't breathe. Yeah. And, and it's even harder because I believe he's my soulmate. Right. So and it's 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 just very hard again, like you said, it, it, equating it back to loss is that you have yeah this but, love for so long and then it's just gone. It's gone, yeah. and you know I'm dealing with the logistics. Yeah, we share things together: furniture, money, an apartment, like right. having to find a new home. Your best friend's gone. Like even little things, like you know he's been texting me like. Only you would appreciate this blank, right, whatever, right. because of course we've been together forever. Right. Um, but like you and I talked about earlier, going on our journeys, 
sometimes you're not okay. Right. And even when something is right, you you personally are not okay. No, and I, you know how I can understand that, and this is one of those things, too, is that for me, and I, I, I deal with everything, whether it's a fault, with sarcasm and jokes. Yeah, yeah. And I, I do it all the time. And you walked in, I think, like two days later after you, and and I was I was trying to make you laugh. Yeah, you called me. You, you said you stepped out of the Matrix because you were wearing uh, like this. You were in like I the, think it was this. It was similar to yeah, this, yeah. yeah. And I said, oh, it's Neo. And you're like, what? And I was yeah. like, yeah, the Matrix. And you're like, not today. Yeah. Are you like, Today's not today, and I was just right away. I was like, I knew, and then I was just like following you around like a puppy dog because I wanted to make no, sure you're, you're okay. fine. And it no, doesn't but, matter. But, but that's what I'm saying though is that you don't you don't realize it because that's unless you're going through it, and when you're going through it's it, all it's awful. Day every yeah. day, you know, you still you have to get up, you have to do your job, you have to be a family member, you have to be a friend, yep. but it, yeah, it's impossible to like be a full person. Um, and yeah, I just I hope he only gets love from this. I hope nobody's says anything mean i'm sure people are going to do what they're going to do but but i mean again that's it this this is this is part of this is what happens in relationships i i hope yeah i mean will there be morons uh, always there's always morons but i think that what i love about this story in general is the respect from both of you guys um the love that is clearly there for one reason or not to we don't that won't be discussed in the show right now it's just you just not there one reason right or, one reason or yeah another. right and now it just can't be no. And, and that, so that is what it is. I think that's something that should be uh, celebrated in a certain aspect to where it's just like those are two people who it's it was it's mature. It's like, you know, it's you work in the same space. Um, so I, th I think it should be applauded more than anything else. I mean, that, not the, the, the demise of the relationship, obviously, but the fact of the way that you're both handling it. I think it should be applauded, to be completely honest with you. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Uh, I hope so. I do have nothing but respect for him. I'm I'm broken hearted and I have to move forward and yeah. on, but I I'll always care about him. Well good. And same here because you guys are both um, you know, your family, both of you guys, and obviously with he's got a show here, you have a show here, you're all the time and and I believe that because I know both of you it it'll it'll mend one way or another. However it will we'll find that out. Yeah. So um Thank Stay you for sharing. Tuned. I know. Thank you for sharing all this stuff too. And there's so much more that we could talk about. But because we're almost out, and you're going to be doing a full one-on-one -on -one with me. Yeah, I know. And so I don't want to. I don't want to use any of my. I've right. been thinking about. I wanted to take notes during this too, but I'll just listen back to it. Yeah, that's fine. Just, I have so many questions. Uh, for so you. let's let's start. I'm going to give you two today. Okay. And then and then you're going to have a whole hour and fifteen hour and twenty when you do a one-on-one -on -one with me next. We're doing taping it next week, so I don't know when we're going to actually air it, but we'll see. When are we taping it? Did we figure I it don't out? know. We tape, I don't know. We'll figure it out after <laughs> this. All right. What's what do you got? I'm talking about working with your best friends. Yeah. Because like five people here consider your best friends. What do you think is the crappiest friend move you've had to do so far? Because it was business question. Crappiest friend move, or, or would you mean like like what was the business decision that you had oh, to make that ended up screwing your friend like as your friend you didn't oh, want to easily, do it easily having i mean when we had to let ken and, and makuga go the first time i i hated that I but hated it, it. were you in the room for that yeah it was awful it was awful and that's why i'm trying like right away got ken on jedi council and found a way to get makuga back in on uh claire live uh i still i want i want grace back on on the schmodown like badly um but it just it just had it it had to be. I mean, complex was you, there was only so much Mark could handle financially. Fernandez could handle financially. So like there was, at the time of we didn't have Clyder live. We didn't. We weren't doing TV talk. We really didn't have it. And the awesome tacular was where Ken and Makuga were really working. We didn't have the show anymore. It was gone. So there was there was nowhere. We, it, the the meetings that we had as far as like. Who, how to move. who to keep where to, how it works like what he can handle you know as far as the, because he, taking it on independently you know not having backing anymore and going through all that and having to sit in that room you know with with Josh and Ken it was after all I mean, Ken and I have been through a lot together Ken and I have been um you know running together since the stand up days in like 2004 2003 around that time and you pulled him over here from screen junkies yes so he was at Schmo. He was working at his job in, in in when he was working security, and I called him up because Andy at the time had told me that he was they were looking for a producer, and I said Ken, and he's like, you think Ken w would want to do it? I said, yeah, Ken. I was like, let me let me talk to Ken. I said, Ken, I think I got you. I think I got you a good gig if you want to get out of this thing. And and he took the screen junkies thing, but I, I it hurt me 
that I had to I, bring him over to yeah. well in general because I didn't have I didn't at the time remember I was doing the show from, at After Buzz so I didn't mm-hmm. I didn't have a budget and it wasn't working anywhere I was freelancing stuff I didn't I didn't have a home and then as soon as I started kind of getting in seeing more of a managerial role at Collider I said I got to find a way to get Ken like I need Ken and and then once Awesome Tacular came in I was like we got to get Ken and so you know I poached him and I got him back so um so it was you know that's why right away I want him on Jedi and I. So he's he's so good independently doing his own thing. I just wish that, you know, something else would land for him, something big, because he's one of the broadcasting most broadcasting in general. He's just one of the most talented people. It's I amazing. Know. Yeah. So that the the and I, that's why I was glad to get Makuga back. The follow up to that is: Do you feel like it has impacted your friendship with either of them? Um, not that, not that particularly, because they knew that that wasn't necessarily my call. If I, you know, it's in, in in general, and I don't even think they would hold anything against Fernandez. I think that they knew it was a bit. They, they both knew it was a business move. When um, you said not that, not it that, sounds that like not that moment, not that moment. Is that what you're talking about? That I'm moment just general? talking about being, working in general, being their boss, essentially. Um, maybe so with with Ken. I mean, Ken. I mean, and but it's also I'd also say that that takes more of a uh, family thing for me. I mean, my. I, my life is I'm here, and then I'm either at a screening or I'm home. Like I'm not weekends. People ask me to go. I get invited to stuff on the weekends all the time. I can't do. I don't do anything on the weekends except. You want no in. more weekend invites. I mean, I want them. I want them. I just you, know, you want to invite, be invited to Boston night, but you don't want to go to I Boston just, night. I, I, I want to. I want to go to. I just can't go to Boston night okay. because I, because a lot of times it's like it's it's harder right now. My wife and I do not have help. Uh, it, 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 my wife is with my kids all day long. Um, and we don't have any help. We don't have, I don't have financially enough to be able to get a nanny and all this stuff too. And my wife would probably never want that anyway. Um, so the weekends are, that's when I'm around. You know, that's when I'm there. I'm Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and I'm with the kids. And so that's usually when people are doing stuff. So it's it's hard for me. So my relationship with those guys, I can't, it's not, I'm not, like Ken and McCoug and I would go drinking after every schmo show. We'd go, we'd have a drink, and and that would that would help as well too. I'm not doing that as much anymore. Um well, it's also not at night. It's also not uh, at night. Yeah. And it, so yeah, I think you just get older. The, the thing is, it's funny, is that because I still work with I still work with Ken every Thursday and on the Schmodown. I see Makuga five days a week because he's here. So, so it feels like you're still. That, that, that's, I think, the benefit of working with your friends. Yeah, it just must be challenging. Yeah. It's, it's a hard dynamic. Yeah. I think you guys have done a really good job. You, Mark, Ken, Makuga, Riley, of all just. Cody, Copster. Yeah, 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 but th- yeah, being around and That's being friends, uh, Cody Cobster for sure. You want one more? Or you want to save it? Well, I ha- my my things are about your family, so we gotta save it because I have like it? all different follows. Okay, we'll do we'll do we'll save it. For I have, you. I'm so curious about old Christian and transitioning into being married Christian with kids and like Oof. your life and, yeah. and movement there. I didn't think I, I could do it. I know. I didn't think I could do it, but we'll talk about it. We'll I save can't it. wait to talk about we'll it. We'll save it. Um, Roxy Stryer, tease. you're the best. You're the best. Thank you. Thanks for, for having me. Of course. I finally like, got it. You finally asked. did it. You finally did it, and and I'm so glad you did because it was a hell of an interview. Um, I learned a lot about you. Had a weird life, right? I wouldn't say weird. Huh. It's, it's a struggle. It's been a struggle it's been for you. A str- the struggle's been, real. The struggle's real, yo. And and you did it, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of you. Oh my gosh! I'm very proud of you. Yeah, you uh, get to be proud. I get to be proud of you. No, I don't. Not from not from because I haven't been on your whole journey with you. You I've don't been get your to be proud of who I, not who, being a dick anymore. Right. But you get to be proud that I am booking yes. and sitting yes. here. Yes. Well, uh, I what was the, what was the words you used? I'm uh, impressed. I'm impressed by you. Oh, I'm very impressed. I'm impressed by, by you too. All right, well, good. Follow Roxy Stryer at Roxy Stryer, mm-hmm. um, and you find her on Collider Live every Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday watching Firework Hammer videos, and we Ugh. will catch you next week on the show. I don't know who I'm going to have on. I have a lot of great guests, but um, leave some comments, be nice to people, and we'll see you next time. That was it. That was the interview. I hope you enjoyed it. If you're joining us for the first time on Collider Video, hit that subscribe button, like, comment, do all that stuff. And remember, this is also on iTunes. If you're listening to iTunes right now, pull over and then rate it, subscribe it, do all that stuff. Hit pause on the treadmill for a second and let us know what you think about these shows. And we will continue to make more of them. You can find all your favorite shows from Collider on iTunes on the Collider Podcast Network. Thank you very much. See you next time.